Okay, so we're going to continue on the theme of diffusion. And I ended the last lecture by saying that you know, we should really be treating diffusion as a function of the free energy gradients rather than of the concentration gradients. And to deal with the free energy of a particular species, we know that we talked about chemical potential. And just to remind you, uh, this is the free energy of a solution, which is a mixture of A and B. And this is the contribution to that free energy due to the A atoms, where this is the chemical potential of a mole of A atoms. And this is the contribution to this free energy of the B atoms. So when I multiply the mole fraction of B times the chemical potential, I get the contribution of B atoms to that particular solution. <coughs> and in terms of a free energy curve, the chemical potential is simply given by the intercept at pure A and pure B for any given solution here. And obviously, if I have another concentration here, then the chemical potential of B will be different, and therefore there will be a driving force for diffusion of B. So it's pretty straightforward to think in terms of chemical potentials instead of in terms of uh, concentrations. Now, how do, we, <coughs> yeah? how do we really interpret it? If the chemical potential of A is more than B, then the diffusion is more to B? No, if the chemical potential of A at a particular position is different from the chemical potential of A at another position, then it will tend to become uniform. Yeah, so the thing that drives the diffusion of A is the chemical potential gradient of A in a binary solution. Yeah. Now, by considering solution models, we came up with uh, curves like this, where this is the free energy of mixing, uh, when we have an enthalpy of mixing which is zero. Uh, on the other hand, when we have a positive enthalpy of mixing, we notice that there are two minima in the curves at low temperature. Now, if I draw that diagram out again, I'm plotting the concentration X here and the free energy of mixing. If I have a curve which looks something like this, I can actually draw a common tangent to this curve. Which means that if I have a solution of any composition along here, let's say this composition, then there will be a reduction in free energy if it changes into a mixture of this solution and this solution. Okay. So that's a single phase. And what I'm saying is that because of the shape of this curve, there will be a tendency for it to decompose into an A-rich and a B-rich region. Now, the interesting thing about this curve is that although the there is a free energy reduction when a solution like this goes to this, to start off that process is quite difficult. Okay, so let me show you why. So supposing I look at a composition here. And I want to change its composition slightly to an A-rich and a B-rich region. So let's say here and here. If I join up these two points, then there is actually an increase in free energy. So to create an A-rich and a B-rich region, to start it off, you actually have to increase the free energy. But ultimately, you will reduce the free energy if you change into that and that. Is that clear? Because of this curvature, yeah? if I put a small perturbation, perturbation means a disturbance on the homogeneity of that solution so that I create a small enrichment of A and a small enrichment of B, I actually get an increase in free energy. Now that is basically nucleation. So even if there is an overall decrease in free energy when the reaction is completed, you first have to go across a barrier, don't you? Have you done nucleation theory at home? With Dr. Greer, for example? Professor Greer? Yeah. Not to worry, we'll do it in more detail. Okay. 
So this is a particularly interesting form of curve. Now, I, I said to you that it's this curvature which causes the problem, okay? that if I give a small perturbation here, there is an increase in free energy. Notice that there is a region here where no matter how small a perturbation I give, there will be a decrease in free energy. Yeah, the curvature here has a different sign from the curvature here. So in this region, the solution ought to spontaneously decompose into a composition wave producing an A-rich and a B-rich region. So spontaneously decompose into A-rich and B-rich regions. Okay, so let's, let's deal with that a bit more formally. So we want to write the flux in terms of a chemical potential gradient. And of course, the gradient of chemical potential is written over here, where x is the distance, and mu a is the chemical potential of a. But remember, mu a is per mole of material. Right? It's the free energy of a atoms, a mole of a atoms in that solution. So I need to multiply by the concentration of a in order to get the gradient of free energy. Okay? Is that clear to you where, where that CA comes from? Just like in that free energy equation we had delta GM is equal to 1 minus x times mu A plus x times mu B, we have to multiply this by concentration in order to get the free energy gradient as opposed to just the free energy per mole. Now, of course, I'm saying the flux is now proportional to the chemical potential gradient. And the proportionality constant is known as the mobility of A atoms. So M is simply a proportionality constant, which is the mobility of A atoms. Now, of course, we have a huge amount of theory, which is expressed in terms of diffusion coefficients. So it's useful to relate this rigorous equation to the empirical fixes laws. So we really need to uh, allow d, the diffusion coefficient, no longer to be a constant, but a function of the chemical potential. So supposing we compare these two equations here, where this is Fix's <coughs> first law, you have the diffusion coefficient and the concentration gradient. Then, by substituting the variation in chemical potential with chemical composition, I get the relationship between the diffusion coefficient and the mobility here. Is everybody happy about that or not? Because remember, we can write d mu a by dx is equal to d mu a by dca times dca by dx. Yeah? So all, all we are doing is substituting for that, and that's where we get this term, and we've got that term there. Okay. So we now have a relationship, a very powerful relationship, between the diffusion coefficient and the way in which mu varies with concentration. And this is where much of the composition dependence of the diffusion coefficient comes from. So if you, if you know your thermodynamics, you can actually determine the composition dependence of the diffusion coefficient. The diffusion coefficient is not really a constant. It will depend on what chemical composition your material is, because you know that mu varies as a function of composition. Right? Therefore, d cannot be a constant. So this is a very powerful and equation that we've derived in a very simple way that although Fix's law is not correct, we like to use it because a huge amount of theory has been developed in terms of diffusion coefficients. And all we do is we substitute this for the diffusion coefficient. We say it's no longer a constant. Everybody happy with that? Yeah. And you're happy with how we got to this point? Yeah. This simple equation here. Now this, of course, brings in all kinds of scenarios. 
Because if the chemical potential decreases when the concentration increases, then the sign of the diffusion coefficient will be negative. So, over here, you see, if a homogeneous solution tends to split into an inhomogeneous solution, that means diffusion is happening up a concentration gradient. Because we are starting with, uh, if I plot distance and composition, we start with a homogeneous material and we develop a composition wave like this, which necessarily means that solute is going up a concentration gradient. So in this region, the chemical potential actually decreases as the concentration increases. Now how can I show that on this curve? Well, let's look at this particular composition. If I draw a tangent to that point, then mu b for that composition will be there. As I increase the concentration of B, mu B has decreased, right? So when you have a curvature which is like this, the chemical potential actually decreases when the concentration increases. Okay. Let's look at this region now, which I explained to you cannot spontaneously decompose into uh, an A-rich and a B-rich region. This diagram is getting a bit complicated, but you're following me, aren't you? Okay. So supposing I take that composition there, and I draw a tangent, then this is mu b for that point. For this point, as I increase the concentration of b, mu b has increased. Okay. So when the curvature is like this, the diffusion coefficient will be positive. Now obviously, in this region, d mu by dc is negative. In this region, d mu by dc is positive. So there must be a point where d mu by dc is zero. In which case, the diffusion coefficient becomes zero. Okay. Interesting, isn't it? OK. So this is just to illustrate that here's a region where <coughs> d mu by dc is positive, negative, and these are called the points of inflection. And in, in between these points of inflection, a solution can decompose spontaneously. With an infinitesimal perturbation, it will tend to decompose into A-rich and B-rich regions. Now, here's a, a movie that I'm going to show you. Uh, which simulates decomposition in this region. Iron, iron chromium is a system in which the chromium atoms prefer to be next to chromium atoms and the iron atoms prefer to be next to iron atoms. In other words, the enthalpy of mixing is positive. And wh what you'll see is we'll start with a completely homogeneous solution and we will see that it develops into chromium rich and so this is completely homogeneous. And look, we are getting chromium-rich regions and iron-rich regions developing spontaneously. So it, is, it isn't that you know um, we are nucleating the phase, but it starts off with a small enrichment of chromium, and that amplitude grows with time. So this is a real effect, and we call this spinodal decomposition. It's known as spinodal decomposition. the spinodal a bit more accurately, the region in which this can happen. But it's got to be in this case because it starts off with an infinitesimally small perturbation, and that perturbation grows with time. That is the identifying characteristic of a spinodal, is that it starts off with a very gentle composition wave which grows in amplitude. Whereas when you nucleate something, it starts off with the equilibrium composition. So at the inflection point, Mm. The diffusion coefficient is zero. Yes, exactly. So nothing. So you wouldn't be able to have any 
any any any political position. Yes. Unless you move the system. Unless you move the yes. yes. That's right. Sorry. That's correct. Because nothing is moving. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's just make this a little bit more formal. Uh, these two points which are defined by the common tangent, any solution in here can decompose into a mixture of this and this, leading to a reduction in free energy. But the process by which it decomposes may involve nucleation or it may involve spontaneous decomposition into A-rich and B-rich regions. So any solution between these two points can decompose with a reduction in free energy and the locus of these two points which are identified by a common tangent gives us a region of the phase diagram where the solution will somehow tend to decompose into the equilibrium composition so th this is what you would this is the curve that you would normally find on a phase diagram so a single solution would not be stable if it lies between the points A and D. It may require nucleation, but certainly there will be a reduction in free energy. Now notice that uh, uh, at some point, a single solution becomes favorable. Yeah? Why is that? You see, here I'm saying that if I have a solution anywhere between these two points, it will tend to decompose into those two. I'm not saying what mechanism, but there is a negative free energy change. Why does that disappear at a certain temperature? Why is a single solution favor? You know, each of these points comes from one of these common tangent contacts. Right. So what's, what's happening as I raise temperature? What? Mm. Yeah. We favor mixing. You favor mixing, and this curve actually changes into a curve which is like that. If you, if you remember, I'll, I'll just bring back that slide. Um, yeah, so you see these curves have two minima at two different uh, low temperatures, but that minimum, uh, two, the two minima has, have disappeared when I go to a very high temperature, because entropy wants everything to be mixed up, right? Okay, so these two points identify what we see in the phase diagram as a miscibility gap, that means there are two solutions which are not miscible inside that gap. Okay. If I take a mixture of petrol or, or oil and water, at a very high temperature will be a single phase. As I cool it into this regime, it will decompose into oil and water. Two immiscible solutions, so that's called a miscibility gap. <coughs> However, if I'm between these two points of inflection, then even an infinitesimal perturbation will tend to grow because there will be a reduction in free energy. And that is what we call the spinodal. In this region, you require nucleation to happen. In this region, even an infinitesimal perturbation will tend to grow in amplitude. So that's just identifying a different mechanism by which the solution will decompose into a lower free energy state. So this is called the spinodo, and this is called the miscibility gap.
know that. So within that region, a solution can spontaneously decompose given an infinitesimal perturbation. So this is the difference between things happening in this regime here and things happening here. In this regime, you need to nucleate a phase, a particle. It will then grow with a constant composition. So when it nucleates, it already has that composition given by the common tangent. It already has the equilibrium composition. If you're doing an experiment and you find that the very smallest particle already has the right composition, it cannot be spinodal decomposition. On the other hand, in a spinodal, even the tiniest perturbation will tend to grow by uphill diffusion until you finally reach the equilibrium composition. So experimentally, it's straightforward to distinguish between these two cases by doing chemical experiments okay, on a very fine scale. We have equipment where you can measure chemical composition on any scale that you like. So are you happy with that? Now, of course, this is happening in three dimensions. Yeah, the composition waves are not waves in one dimension, but it's like a three-dimensional wave of composition. Now, whenever you have a composition change, you will also have a change in lattice parameter because the atoms are, you know, chromium atoms are different in size from iron atoms, right? So, whenever you have a composition gradient, you will also have strain in the lattice because the lattice parameter at one point is different from the lattice parameter at another point, right? And that will cause strain energy. And that energy is called coherency energy and is proportional to the modulus, the elastic modulus. And this is how much the lattice parameter is trained as a function of composition. Now supposing I draw a stress versus strain curve. So this is strain. And it looks like this. Can you tell me what the strain energy is at any point? Yeah. Area under the curve, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the strain energy, which is equal to half sigma epsilon. Yeah. Now, if I want to get rid of epsilon, then I can write that as um, stress over strain is the modulus, isn't it? So I can write that as sigma e. So this is equal to half sigma squared times modulus. Is that right? Yes. Stress over strain is equal to modulus. Yeah. No. Um, sorry? Only. Square of only. Yeah. I'm getting confused here. <laughs> okay. Sigma square yeah. What I want to do, I, I know why I'm getting confused. I want to replace sigma, not epsilon, so that's equivalent to E epsilon squared, okay? And that's what we have here. This is the strain due to composition variation, and this is the modulus. So you know where that equation comes from. Now, we need to take account of that strain. Uh, it has to be provided by the free energy change. And what that means is that things will not tend to happen when we are within the chemical spinodal, but we'll have to undercool further in order to account for that strain energy. So this is called a third curve called the coherent spinodal. And really, you won't get spinodal reaction in this region because we haven't got enough free energy to account for that strain but it will happen once we undercool the material to within the coherent phenomenon. So that's a strain energy term which suppresses the spontaneous decomposition process. Now you know that crystals are not isotropic. 
that their properties vary with direction. And one of the properties which varies with direction is the modulus. So if the modulus varies, then it might be easier to develop a composition wave along one direction than another. And that's exactly what you see. This is uh, a spinodal in a copper nickel iron alloy, which is slightly anisotropic. Okay, nothing to write home about. It, it, it's still fairly isotropic. But if you look in this system, the modulus along this direction is very small compared with the modulus along this direction. So the decomposition process becomes extremely anisotropic. So that bas basically is Pinodo decomposition. And we've identified a region within the phase diagram where you do not require nucleation. You simply require the infinitesimal perturbation which can be provided by thermal uh, processes and then the solution tends to decompose into a composition rich and composition poor region. And this can only happen when the enthalpy of mixing is positive. In other words, A rich and B rich regions are favored. Now, of course, what are the uses of spinodal decomposition? Well, one of the uses is that it's effectively like precipitation. And if you introduce on a very fine scale precipitation, then you will strengthen your material. So it is one of the mechanisms of strengthening materials. Any questions? Okay, see you this afternoon then.